They quoted him as nobody to translate, nobody to dub, nobody to mix. The industry just doesn't have enough resources to do it. 20%, so one in five people, said they would stop watching a show on average once per month because of the poor quality subtitling and dubbing. The reason why I go to so many events and I do so many things to be visible and stay there in the customer's mind when they need us. And welcome everyone to Slitterpot 94. Hello from Zurich. Hello from London. Beautiful, beautiful Wednesday. We're recording this. It'll be up by Friday. And special guest today, Diego Crescheri, founder and CEO of Creative Words, uh, co-founder and CEO of Creative AI, and now president of ALIA, the European Language Industry Association. So looking forward to talking to Diego. But before Diego, we have Mr. Beast. Talk about Mr. Beast and dubbing. And, you know, those of you who don't know Mr. Beast, you're probably over 25. Um, then we'll talk your about... Age, it's betraying you now, your age. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm under 25, you know that, right? Oh, um, so... yeah. Well, I also did not know about Mr. Beast, so there we go. We're, we're, we're all over 25. Uh, yes. Not all of them. Uh, so... Moving on from the age debate to EGA, Media Entertainment Localization Consumer Impact Study, so staying with Media Log, Kudo integrates with Microsoft Teams and AMN third quarter figures. But first, Esther, would you sit in mm. snakes for $10,000? No, absolutely not. Like, snakes are my worst nightmare. I can't even watch them on TV. So, no, it doesn't matter how much you give me. No. There you go. So, would you click on a video where somebody says, would you see no. snakes for 10? No. You wouldn't even click. <laughs> Wait, do I have to look at the snake? Uh, well, you're going to have to look at them on, on YouTube. No. no. All right. So, that, that's one of the titles uh, of the YouTube videos, uh, one of the Mr. Beast YouTube videos. Would you sit in snakes for $10,000? Another one is, I spent 50 hours buried alive. The other one, another one was spending 24 hours on top of a mountain. That sounds okay to me. Uh, <laughs> and another one was, I filled my brother's house with slime and bought him a new one. Seems like quite wasteful. <laughs> so that's the kind of content that got Mr. Beast to 70 million YouTube subscribers. I'm, uh, as far as I know, it's probably one of the most, if not the most popular YouTube accounts. And, you know, his videos have usually like a hundred million plus views, even more than that. Maybe, you know, I don't know, maybe one of them snakes videos gets to, to, a, to a billion. So why are we talking about sitting with snakes for $10,000? Um, because, uh, Mr. B Beast just tweeted out, uh, that English isn't always our fans first language. So we decided to start dubbing our videos for them. Can't believe how well we're doing. Uh, or they're doing the videos, mm. uh, and they do well indeed. So Mr. Beast Espanol, uh, the Spanish channel already has 8 million subscribers and they only uploaded 32 videos so far. I mean, check that out. 32 videos, wow. 8 million subscribers. Um, and the videos get easily five, 10 million views too in, in Spanish and they're dubbing it. So the uh, dubbing, it's kind of a, it's kind of a mix between kind of lip syncing and voiceover and uh, like lip sync dubbing and mm. kind of voiceover. So it's not perfect, like, you know, feature movie, uh, cinematic level type of dubbing, but it's, it's quite, mm -hmm. it's quite okay. You don't hear the, the back, like you don't hear the original language anymore. So it's not really a, a mm. voiceover time of, uh, type of, uh, uh, dubbing. Um, and they actually credit the uh, the dubbing studio and the platform they're using. And we did a bit of research so, uh, in, in, in the YouTube video. So the, the, the dubbing platform is a, a platform called unilinguo.tv. Never heard of them. So we'll, we'll be following them now, Unilinguo TV. And uh, the dubbing studio uh, for the Spanish one is a, an Argentina-based studio called Magma Studios. Uh, they even credited the... Um, the the voices uh so uh the, the voice actors right mm, interesting that's good i mean this is really interesting i i mean we you know we, we had the uh, paper cup on the podcast and, and you know they're basically that's their um a niche i mean it's basically you mm. know dubbing of youtube videos uh and so this i mean if 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 a youtuber with you know 30 million uh, sorry 70 million subscribers is getting this kind of traction dubbing the video, uh, dubbing YouTube videos, you know, yeah. others will try too. So this will be a mm, 
major market going forward. And mm. if the quality expectations are going to increase, at least for kind of the really professional YouTubers, it might actually add uh, more fuel to that talent shortage fire, pardon the really <laughs> weird metaphor here. But uh, we did also pick up on another story, rest of the world dog award reported and quoted the Iuno SDI C CEO, uh, David Lee, who we had at Slidicon remote. So he's saying, hey, there is a real, uh, you know, t talent crunch. They quoted him as nobody to translate, nobody to dub, nobody to mix. The industry just doesn't have enough resources to do it. So yeah, hot take here. I mean, if you got big YouTubers starting to also wade into the, the, the market for dubbing talent while, you know, all the big uh, streamers are already there and then the studios, I mean, well, there's yeah. going to be a much bigger market for dubbing. So, uh, you know, I guess a good, uh, good place to be for companies like, you know, Paper Cup and others as well. So one of the growth markets, dubbing. For sure. Yeah. Now you looked at, um, an, a study published by EGA. We, you know, we had Chris Fetner on the pod, uh, almost a year ago now when they launched EGA. Mm -hmm. So now I think they have one of their, uh, kind of flagship, uh, studies out. So tell us more about that. Also about dubbing and subtitling, I believe. Yeah. So as you said, it's a, a study, a report out from EGA, um, about they call it the localization consumer impact study, um, but it is entertainment and media localization. Um, that's, you know, that's the sector that they're, they're interested in. Um, so this is their full, full study that was published last week on November the 4th. Um, and they conducted a research project basically to understand what impact localization has. Um, so of, you know, entertainment videos, um, on consumers in the figs market, so in France, Germany, Spain, and Italy. Um, and it was apparently based on 15,000 respondents, so fairly sizable study that they conducted there. Uh, but they came up with them, um, sort of pulled it all together and came up with um, quite a few, you know, interesting findings there. I mean, anyone who's you know, more interested, go to the EGA website and download the report, 10 pages, um, yeah, for for your own interest, but a um, few key figures I sort of picked out were um, from their findings, localization is widely utilized in this market or these markets, sorry, and makes up 52%, uh, so more than half of the content consumed in entertainment. Um, then one I thought was quite interesting was one of the questions was, how aware are you, since it's asking the consumers, how aware are you that you're watching a localized version? So if you're watching I suppose dubs because, I mean, subtitling, how can you not be aware? But 60% um, said they were completely aware when they're watching, that they are watching dubbing. Um, and 26% said somewhat aware. So I think we're kind of far from having this sort of immersive experience, um, you know, for better or worse. But anyway, more than sort of 86%, 86% of people are somewhat or completely aware that they're watching uh, dubbed content. And... Okay. Can I Do just you have pause a take for a second? Yeah. 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 Um, I mean, the question, I, I mean, I have no idea how they phrase the question. If that's yeah. the way they phrase the question, I guess the results would be tilted to the aware side of the spectrum. But if you like actually look mm -hmm. into people's brains at the time of consumption, I mean, how can you always be aware that you're watching a localized <laughs> version? I mean, I remember as a kid, I mean, I have no idea that these, I mean, I had no idea. Mm. Like, I mean, I guess. I mean, also it, sometimes you have to physically choose the dubbed option, whereas a lot sometimes it will just play as the default. Right? Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, okay. Like you're you're kind of if somebody asks you now, like, are you aware? Yeah, okay. I guess I'm aware. If you're asking me, like, well, yeah, me. because I click to to watch yeah. it. Yeah, but if you're actually experiencing the movie, I doubt many people are continuously aware that this is a dubbed version. I mean, otherwise, it's quite poor dubbing in my view. But I guess that's a question others yeah might have and it also didn't say continuously aware i mean over the span of the movie or over the span of the series but it's completely aware at some point but i, I thought it was interesting because i mean it's it's a question that you know maybe is worth asking when you're talking about wanting to sort of generate these kind of um immersive experiences for audiences uh obviously yeah like maybe you want to study what's people what is going on in people's brains while they're watching uh but that's uh 
somewhat more challenging to do than just ask them. <laughs> and yes. then one one True. question, which I think uh, I think I've seen uh, sort of, uh, quoted elsewhere um, since, is Have you ever stopped watching a show because of poor quality subtitling or dubbing? Um, so the question is ever. Um, 30, 36% of people said they've never stopped watching because of poor quality at localization. 37% said once a year they might switch off because the dubbing or subtitling is so bad. 20%, so one in five people, said they uh, would stop watching a show on average once per month uh, because of the poor quality subtitling and dubbing. And 7%, so quite a small percentage, said uh, once per week they turn it off because they don't like dubbing or subtitling quality that is being offered. I, I mean, I think once a month, one in five people turning off once a month is, is quite is quite high. Do you think? It's quite high. I mean, talking millions, tens of millions of people, right? I mean, right. if you scale this yeah. up to the real audience, this is is huge. I mean, even thirty seven percent. I mean, so basically half are turning off. Uh, actually, more than half if you tally this all up. Like, uh, mm. you know, or, or stop watching. I mean, set set once once per week. Um. Seems a little high. Like, well, so what, 52 <laughs> times a year you're turning on? Oh, yeah. oh, those dubs. So maybe they're... watching the same yeah. show every week yeah. and then just forgetting that it's bad and turning off. But, but um, this is a fantastic you're... data point. <laughs> it's really good. Yeah, For and I industry. think, um, yeah, that that was one of the ones that I think the report kind of focused on and obviously drew out a bit more analysis around that uh, and kind of using it as a... Uh, one, of the ma- one of the many reasons uh, for which companies should strive to provide you know good quality subtitling dubbing localization generally um, and i'll just read out this final thought if if you'll allow me um which they say in the report is perhaps one of the most provocative findings in this research is the financial value that uh, respondents in figs place on localization experience uh, relative so the question was posed as how much of your subscription streaming fees do you think should be allocated to localization um, and they said, the respondents said an average of 48% of their fees should be allocated to localized localize content. Um, so, I mean, that's pretty high. And the the report makes the point that, you know, this is an extremely high percentage. It's well above the current industry investment for localizing, which is apparently sort of up to about 1% for these, for these languages and, and locales. Uh, but they're saying it's a good indicator that these consumers value the art of content localization and its impact to enjoying uh, streaming content. I mean, maybe it's sort of underestimating how much everything else costs <laughs> in the in the production chain to say, you know, spend about half of my subscription on localizing or localized content. Um, but yeah. Well, with that, you can basically just produce local content then. Just yeah, okay. you know, hire local actors. Get I, d- it, uh, I don't think it's real. Yeah, I don't think it's realistic that you know Netflix spends I don't know what is it like eight pounds or something from my subscription every month specifically on localized or localizing content. Um, I wouldn't mind. But... It would double the size and triple or quadruple <laughs> the size of of the industry we cover. So by all means, you yeah, know, but you might end up with some uh, quite. You might end up with some like actually quite you know rubbish content. If they're pay- paying all the money on localization and not paying any money for all the rest of the things that they need to pay attention to, but anyway, the point is there that obviously people value localization and think that it uh, should be uh, or localized content and think it should be you know play a significant part in the kind of overall portfolio of entertainment that they have access to. Agree. So congratulations to EGA and Chris. It was an interesting report, and go check it out if you're interested. Uh, yeah, you can actually just download it, right? There is no gating yeah. or anything. Yeah, that, that's the beauty. Uh, you have to enter an uh, email, but um, oh, well. yeah, not that difficult. It's a, a small price to pay. So complete switch. Let's go yes. over to uh, one of the announcements. Uh, we keep getting these announcements where like RSI and you know video interpreting providers are integrating with certain big tech platforms. So this week it was Kudo integrating or announcing they integrated with Microsoft Teams. So tell us a bit more about that. And then we also had a look at uh, just kind of fairly superficial look at like what what are some of the other uh, RSI providers and and video interpreting providers integrate with? Yes. So the announcement is that Kudo, as you said, has uh, integrated with Microsoft Teams. They announced that last week, November the 4th. 
So the integration there uh, allows, I think, Kudo customers can now access um, the real-time interpreters through Teams. So they would add Kudo to a Teams meeting using um, what is called the Microsoft App Source. This is sort of like the App Store um, that you can add on um, for Microsoft. Um, so that would give people access to two, more than 200 um, spoken languages, sign languages, uh, interpreters. Um, and they can use Kudo's language selector to both listen and, they say, engage in their preferred language while in Teams. Um, and so Fardad, who is the CEO of Kudo, was quoted as saying that current and prospective customers frequently ask to use our platform inside Microsoft Teams. So it sounds like there was obviously demand there already, which um, makes sense if they're kind of going, if Kudo's already working with several or, or many uh, enterprise customers who are already sort of signed up to Teams. Um, so, yeah, one of the benefits there is that meeting hosts can, um, you know, book on-demand interpreters and run their kind of event logistics as well in terms of the interpretation side using Kudo's um, interpreters so they can have access to Kudo's interpreters um, up to, I think it's up to 32 languages supported um, in this integration and it supports up to 20,000 participants per meeting. So fairly, fairly broad there. Wow. Um, okay. So yeah, what about the I others? Mean, we did a Yeah, quick... no, that was interesting in terms of looking yeah. at um, like you said, I mean, this is not the first announcement of its kind where we've seen remote simultaneous interpreting or as Kudo likes to be called, the kind of multilingual meetings platforms integrate with some of the larger um, video conferencing platforms. Um, so we had a quick look on the RSI, some of the RSI providers. So Kudo itself um, also integrates, they say on their website, with Blue Jeans, Adobe Connect. EventMobi, Google Meet, Hopin, as well as Microsoft Teams. Um, you've got Interprefy as well that is integrated with GoToWebinar, Hopin, Microsoft Teams, Zoom, On24, WebEx, and BlueJeans. That's again, according to their website. Um, and then, yeah, also Interactio, whose CEO we had on the podcast as well yeah, several months ago. Yeah. Um, they, on their website, say they integrate with Zoom, Skype, uh, teams and Webex. Um, and then also if you go into that app store that I mentioned, the Microsoft app source thing, uh, you see that you can add Kudo, Interpretify, and another platform called Rafiki, um, for interpreting. Rafiki. Providers. Rafiki. Yeah. Let's um, research for Rafiki. Yeah. I mean, obviously there are, there are many more platforms, uh, or many more sort of conferencing um, services to check out and I'm sure they all have uh, <laughs> so, or at least some if not uh, many different options for uh, adding remote interpreting um, but the Zoom, Zoom was slightly different I think and, and somewhat interesting in its approach so Zoom has this app marketplace um, and they have uh, 30 apps that are listed under transcription ca category so this would sort of also encompass the live transcript uh, or live captioning so they've got rev they've got trim they've got verbit who provide this live transcription or and or live captioning um zoom doesn't have an interpreting category specifically but if you remember like this is in its marketplace but if you remember they um had uh well partnership i think with boost lingo um but yeah. that's technically included under the healthcare category so they've got kind of telehealth healthcare um, partnerships or integrations as well that they offer and Boost Lingo is one of them. Um, yeah. Good. Boost Lingo. Yeah. They, um, they're one of the competitors of the company we want to talk to, uh, now, which is AMN or not, yeah. well, a competitor or like enabling competitors, basically. So AMN, if uh -huh. you remember, they, they acquired Stratus video folded into two one of their divisions, AMN being a $5 billion kind of healthcare services and technology mark, uh, $5 billion market cap company based, uh, listed in New York, uh, published their results uh, about, what is it? Hang on, for the quarter, $878 million in, in revenue. 
they did break out Stratus Video. This is the VRI mm. uh, interpreting company they, they acquired again. Uh, Stratus Video revenue was $47 million a quarter, up 33% over the prior year. That's uh, that's a massive wow. growth right there. And uh, the CEO said, um, we may not expect it to grow 33% every year for the future, no. but if it can just continue to grow in the teens, that will be nice. That's what AMN CEO Susan Salka said in, a, in an analyst conference. So, well, I mean, you know, if you tell it up, that's two hundred million dollars, nearly two hundred million dollars annual recur or annual revenue mm. for Stratus. Now, if you analyze it, that that's that's big. And you know, remember that the 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 price was super high. I don't remember, but it was was it a billion dollars or something? Four seven five. Yeah, it was like four seven five. Four seven five. The the price. I have that in my mind. You remember that? All right. <laughs> I have that. I think so. <laughs> Congratulations on that. Well, uh, am I right? Yeah. That's new. But it's nice. So, but well, it's twice. It's two times revenue. So basically, as they're growing, the purchase price seems to justify. It seems to become more and more justified, right? Um, so you know, again, this is video interpreting. We just spoke about kind of video interpreting over the more big tech platforms. This I mean, Stratus is basically video interpreting for healthcare over a, a technology over a platform that's integrated by a service provider like AMN. So there's just mm -hmm. so much movement, right, in the space. And then you have, again, Boost Lingo, that's basically an option for, uh, you know, LSPs wanting to provide this type of service, but license the tech. So there's just so much movement in, in that market. And, uh, yeah, it's fascinating seeing, uh, f seeing where this is going and if really the, kind of the remote healthcare space uh, here is, is um, yeah, it's is going to continue to grow. I think in the U.S. it's just, it's a huge market, but Europe seems to be, nowhere near the level of service and or integration, but the need would seem to be very, mm. very high. So I would expect a ton of growth in this type of business in, in, in the European Union. I mean, currently, I, you know, seems all very super local, uh, maybe nation, some nationwide contracts but mo for the public sector, but uh, qu quite, quite locally sourced. All right, so let's head to Italia. And talk to okay. Diego Crescieri, founder and CEO of Creative Words. Catch you on the other side. And welcome back, everybody, to Slater Pod. Today we are super excited to have Diego Crescieri on the pod. Hi, Diego. Hi, nice, nice to meet you. How are you? Hey, hey Diego. Hi, welcome. Esther. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Diego, you're the founder and CEO of Creative Words, most recently also the president of the board of directors of ALIA, the European Language Industry Association. And we're definitely going to speak about ALIA and uh, in submission what you guys are doing. So, where does this podcast find you today? What country? What city? I'm connected from Genoa, Italy. Genoa, Italy, the place where the sea is closest to uh, from from where I am. It's, uh, you know, oh, if yeah. you drive yeah. in a straight line from Zurich, you get to Genoa, and that's the closest I can get to the sea. I think it's about oh, a nice. four-hour drive. Beautiful city. Awesome. So uh, thanks for joining again, uh, Diego. So first, tell us a bit about your personal background. How did you get started in the language industry? What, you know, what year, what time? How did you get into this? So uh, it's, it's quite a standard story. I studied languages. I decided to study languages when I was 14. And that's all I did, basically. And I started as a translator before graduating. I was supposed to become an interpreter. I've never done interpreting. I don't like it. And so I started as a translator in another company here in Genoa. Well, we, was, we were not in Genoa. We were in a smaller city back then. And, and then I became a project manager because I got sick of translating after a short time, I would say. Uh, so I became a project manager, and then in 2008, I became a partner of that company. So it's pretty standard. And after 11 years in that company, uh, I left. And yesterday, it was our fifth anniversary with Creative Words. So no, no nothing really strange or weird to, to tell you. It's pretty standard. But it's, it's been languages for since I was 14. Well, you say it's standard, but I mean, you know, it takes uh, a lot of conviction to, you know, go that path and then also start your own company. So I, yep. I don't think it's super standard. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, we've heard, I think we've heard all sorts of uh, kind of journey stories into the industry from kind of lawyers to, I don't know, bankers and everything <laughs> in between. But let's talk briefly um, about your appointment to Elia. So I think it was announced uh, just last month that you're the new president of the board. Uh, so congratulations on that. Thank I think so we'll dive a little bit deeper into 
the aims of Elia and goals a bit later on. But uh, what was your journey to being appointed into uh, the pres president of the board? Role? Oh, I'm still amazed by, by that journey. Well, basically, my second event in the industry was in 2017. It was an Elia event in part. Back then, it was focused for project management. And I, I met Francoise there. She used to be the president of Elia back then. Uh, I had lunch with her, and I didn't knew, know Elia at all. So I sat with her at lunch, and she explained it by, uh, about the association. And yeah, so this is where I really came to know the association, because I had no idea. Uh, and then it was in 2017, I, was, I had just started my company. I, I was trying to get as visible as I could in the industry. Uh, I had even uh, applied for, for the gala board at some point. Uh, in Ali, I was accepted in 2018. Uh, I got accepted. I think that's because uh, I was starting to get to be visible uh, in the industry. So th that's where I entered the board of Ali in 2008. And uh, our usual term would be two years, but with COVID, we had to extend by one year. So I stayed there for three years. And then Cleo, the former president, she, she, she told us she would be leaving the association. And so I, I said, I thought to myself, well, let's try and see if it works. And since I have no, no, I, I, don't, I, I don't want to, to leave the association anytime soon. I think that uh, I could, uh, the association could use uh, like a longer leadership maybe. And so let, let's see if I get voted again next year. <laughs> so that's my path. And then you mentioned also founding your company, Creative Words, about I think five or so years ago. Um, what was your experience of, of setting setting up and launching out on your own? And just generally, how would you characterize or maybe how was that experience shaped by the fact that you're you're based in Italy and what, what's the market like over there? Oh, the, the experience. So as I said, in 2008, I became, became partner of the other company. So that, that's where I built my managerial skills, I would say, and my entrepreneurial skills. Uh, I also attended a master uh, in you know how to manage companies because that's not something you get to learn in school and translation in language schools. And so founding the company was not that difficult. Basically, the model was pretty much the same, only the, the clients were different because for uh, NDA reasons, I could not, of course, get in touch with my former customers. Uh, and I started by myself in, yeah, as I said, November uh, 2016. Uh, I was by myself for, for long, uh, long three months, uh, and then I hired a marketing person. That's where I started. Uh, and then a project manager, and the rest is the story. Uh, so it was pretty, again, not too exciting probably for, for, for people to listen to. It was pretty standard story. Uh, the, the industry in Italy is... Well, it was difficult for me to approach Italian customers. Uh, I think the only customer I got from sending many call, uh, many emails, many messages, and having many calls was just one. Uh, in Italy, it's difficult to sell, and it's still difficult to sell language services to Italy, I would say. Uh, the industry is quite cr uh, crowded. It's many of us out there in Italy as well. Uh, now I can say we, we do have an international uh, client base, so I, I really not too much affected by the Italian uh, market, which, by the way, is not the best one it could be, in, I, I guess. I just I just read, though, literally uh, about half an hour ago, I think it was, uh, and that was my local newspaper here, Zurich newspaper, so they're saying basically tell, Italy is heading into a boom period. Like, they're saying that Draghi is, you know, changing a lot of the economic policy, and there's like some funding coming from the European Union and things are looking up. At least that's what they what they're saying. Well, I think in terms of being uh, in terms of authority, Draghi is quite well known and this is helping us a lot. I think in terms of trust also from other countries and trust of the Italian economy as well. He's quite famous, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was what was the ECB president? Anyway, yeah. back to Creative Words. Tell us more about. Creative words in a nutshell, key client segment services, you know, what are you guys focusing on? Well, it's, it's dynamic, okay? So it's not anything fixed. Uh, I, was, I was in the last uh, ELIA event where I took my decision on our positioning and could be the final one or I could change my mind. 
like tomorrow, but uh, <laughs> there's the entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah. So I think we will focus on offering Italian and as a target language for international customers. That's where we perform the better. That's where we have the better relationships with customers. Uh, and that's probably what we will do. As I said, in the next days, at least, since, uh, as long as I don't change my mind. Uh, so we do offer any kind of service we could offer for, for those customers. Uh, translation, of course, post-editing, that's where we started. And Creative World was supposed to offer creative services, but then we focused on machine translation maybe too much. Uh, we're doing that, of course, but doing subtitling, voiceover. The only thing I, we are not doing, I think, is interpreting at the moment. We're not really into that. Uh, and then, of course, we started to offer other services, like content creation, copywriting, data collection, and uh, I'll mention that later, maybe. So, again, uh, for the, those kind of customers, we offer any kind of services you can think of for Italian, but then we also work with multi-language vendors as well. So, depending on what they ask us to do, we, we do that. Usually, we, I tend to be the one who accepts everything because I think we can learn from those experiences. Uh, so, again, we, we, all linguistic services you can think of, trying to add some automation and some innovation in, in what we offer. Uh, and it, it's uh, 360 degree linguistic services plus the data and CEO, uh, consultancy, all of that. Mm. And coming back then to those, the data services, um, so you co-founded a separate company, Creative AI, uh, and I think that was launched just this year in 2021. What, what was the sort of idea or motivation behind keeping that pretty separate from, uh, from the LSP side? Well, yeah, I, the first time I think I worked on a data project was 2016, uh, no, 2010, sorry. Uh, I think it was for Lionbridge, and there was a market there already back then, and it's growing, of course, you, we all know that, and we got many requests last year as well during the pandemic about data, and, but we, we struggle in managing those projects because you need a lot of people, you need to pay them, you need to onboard them and train them and, and so on. So I thought, why don't we try and build some technology to, to be able to manage that? Uh, and basically, I didn't want creative words to, to, to put creative words, if you want, at risk by investing too much money into that. And the other reason why I kept it separate is because I'm hoping I get some funds being that an innovative startup. Uh, so I might be able to access some funding, hopefully. It's not happened yet, so we'll see. Uh, of course, the, the two companies are quite intertwined. I mean, we work together quite a lot of course, uh, in different things. But yeah, the idea was uh, Creative AI could uh, contribute to the, let's say, visibility of Creative Words offering the data services and, and mm. vice versa, right? So we, could, we can provide the technology from Creative AI to Creative Words. Creative Words can uh, provide the network if you want and the customers because many MLVs are requesting those kind of services. And at the same time, creative AI could work independently to build the technology. That was so. It's so yeah, it's, when you're saying the MLVs, I mean, it's really interesting that this kind of the language, the tr historical kind of translation industry supply chain is now really kind of gearing towards this data uh, collection and annotation model, right? And I mean, I yeah, as you said, Limebridge, you know, 2010. I mean, they've done this for for quite some time, but it's just I think it's it's not really happening across uh, broader parts of the industry. Um, yeah. Let's talk about post editing. And I remember the first time you and I spoke, I think on a call, it was like in 2017. And I think you were really early to the post editing game. As far as I remember, you were really switched on in terms of the pricing and how you wanted to offer this. So let's talk about this. So I'm trying to shift the conversation a little bit with what we're putting out to like expert in the loop from like the human in the loop, right? Cause I feel, well, being human doesn't really help much these days to add much value to, to, uh, you know, machine translation. So, you know, t tell us more about how you approach this. You have an ISO certification for post editing. 
Like, how do you see this? And what's the end goal here? Is it really post-editing or are we going into a more kind of interactive, dynamic way of working with uh, empty output? Yeah, as, as you said, we, we started quite early and in Italy we were among the first ones, I would say. And for sure the first one to get certified for post-editing. Uh, I basically, it happened why a customer approached me asking for 300,000 words in a couple of days. And I said yes, because that was the, uh, the first big job that I could you know, get some money from. And so that's why I, why I started with post-editing. It's changed a lot, of course. The machine translation quality has improved, and uh, we have a huge uh, provider base for post-editing. We had to train them a lot, of course. And... Is, is it changing? I don't know. We, we still receive the, the traditional project with just post-editing. Someone also asks for light post-editing, even if it's something I don't like. Um, so I haven't seen that change myself personally. Of course, I'm quite uh, up-to-date with what's happening on the market. But for us, it, it doesn't change too much, I would say. Uh, apart from the fact that machine translation is improving and price pressure, of course, is always there. Uh, volumes probably have increased. So I, I, w I was one of those companies that worked on those big e-commerce projects back in 2018. Uh, everybody was working on those projects for that big e-commerce website. Um, that's not there anymore, but e-commerce has, has, has got, got a boost last year, for instance. So we're working on those kind of projects. And yeah, I would say the change that I've seen is uh, volumes are increasing. It's not just that one single client that's sending us volumes. Uh, so, yeah, th that's the change I've seen. Uh, in terms of skills and, and people we are using, I think it's quite the same as it was in 2017. That's my experience, okay. of course. And do you mentioned price pressure. I mean, can, can we talk about maybe not the, the actual rates? I mean, if you're happy to share, by all means, right? But, like, do you see this still being a unit rate game or like, okay, it's per word or whatever? Or are you able to charge per hour for certain select clients already? Is that something you want to do? What are your thoughts on that? For machine translation, you mean no, we don't, we're not charging yeah, for, per hour. Yeah, post editing, yeah. We, yeah. we are charging still by the word. Uh, depending on the projects, there's a lot of price pressure, as I said. Uh, I think for some projects, we had to cut the, the weight in half. Uh, compared to 2017, because the volumes are, are bigger and the customer would expect some reduction. Uh, what we do usually is we, we try and test the productivity, increase the productivity gain ourselves, or at least we, we let's say we pilot them. When the, the customer comes to us with a productivity in mind, we, we offer them a range uh, of discounts and then we try and see where we stand in that range. Um, so again, it's quite traditional. Sometimes you ask for TR or other form of pricing, which I don't like, by the way. Mm. I, I don't like the post-editing analysis or TR or whatever you want to call it. I don't think it's fair for, for no one probably in the supply chain. So we traditionally apply just word rate, and, but based on, on some testing of the productivity gain. Mm. I mean, talk, talking about productivity then, um, I mean, you know, CAT or translation productivity tools, obviously, you know, potentially a key part of that along with TMS, MT. What, what generally is your approach at Creative Words to sort of buy versus build when it comes to language technology? Well, we, we don't build any technology. I mean, the main technology, the, the CAT tool, we just use the ones that are on the market depending on what the customer are asking us to, to use. Uh, because as I said, we, we work with many MLVs and they all have their preference. So, but what we do and we try to do is we try to, to do what we can in between. So we, we are using many automations and we are uh, using many of these things that you can do to, to make thing, uh, things better for the project managers, for instance. So we, we build that, but we by the, the main technology, I would say. And, and this is where, for, uh, for instance, Creative AI is helping Creative Words to build those kind of connections. And of course, we also use other third-party services for automation and, and so on, but 
the more and more we are working with creative AI to do that. And it's working pretty fine, I would say. Cool. Um, you mentioned earlier that your very first hire was marketing. And I was going to ask you about marketing because you got one of the best marketing games in the industry for, you know, the, the, your, your, the, the size of, of the LSP that you run. Uh, like, congrats on that. And, and like, it, you're kind of the cheerleader. You're like a CEO, like marketing cheerleader. St tell us how, wh wh why, uh, you know, also with your linguistic background, I mean, typically translators, well, I'm, I'm super generalizing here, but like, uh, you know, they may not be the, the very best marketers, right? So how come your first hire was a marketing person? And like, what, what do you, what's your thoughts around, you know, marketing and sales as well? Uh, in my former company, we, we used not to go to events. We didn't go to any events. We, didn't, we were not visible. We would not market our service. It was just traditional selling. And I kind of didn't like that. So as you said, when I left uh, my own company, the first hire was a marketing person. Now uh, we do have a marketing department. I, I would call it department. It's a small one. It's one point, one and a half person working on marketing. But still, it, it's quite big for the industry and for companies my size. When I go to events, everybody asks me, how can you do that? Well, I have, I'm paying someone to do that. So if you see a post coming from, from Diego, that's me doing the marketing. But if it's coming from Creative Words, there's someone else doing that. Um, and uh, it's becoming more and more a, a company, a global effort by the company team members. Because everybody's doing that now. And I think it's really working great. Uh, my biggest customer, I find it to social media. So, so that's working. I, I really believe if, if you can do the best, you can offer the best services. Uh, in the industry, but if your potential customers are not there, uh, you don't, they don't know what you do, then it's useless. So, yeah, we're investing a lot on visibility and marketing. And uh, I would say the reason why I go to so many events and uh, do so many things is to be visible and stay there in the customer's mind when they, they need us. And, and it's working, you know. And then you create your... Uh, they, they, yeah, customer thinks that you are you can provide value, of course, and you need to keep the promise. But the customer is really important. What What are your top platforms? I mean, like in thoughts around Facebook versus uh, Twitter versus LinkedIn. I mean, we're seeing most traffic on LinkedIn. Which, if you talk to some other industries, they're like, "What? What do you mean LinkedIn? Like, no one's." But in, in the language industry, LinkedIn seems to be at least for us number one. So. What do you think about that? Yeah, it's number one for me as well. I think I'm getting close to 17,000 followers on LinkedIn, which is it's quite amazing. Big. Yeah. Nice. Uh, I'm using <laughs> Twitter like I'm not going to Twitter and tweet and do tweets there. I just use you know, LinkedIn and post on Twitter as well. Uh, Facebook is mostly for my personal and family stuff uh, as well as Instagram. So I would say, yeah, uh, LinkedIn for me works be best. For the company, we are trying to expand on Instagram because that, that's where we uh, talk with our supply chain. And we also try TikTok as well because oh, wow. that's the next generation coming, right? So if you talk with young students uh, in their 20 about LinkedIn, well, they look at you like you are like their grandpa. And I don't like that I sensation. <laughs> <laughs> so we tried the, uh, yeah, TikTok as well. And it worked. I'm not sure where we are now because, as I said, I have someone doing that, but it worked. And uh, yeah, depending on, on, on what's, what's your objectives, then I think you need to be more or less everywhere. How, how about paid, like paid uh, ads or like Google SEO paid ads there? Because we, you know, in my previous life with LSPs, I, we, did, we did run a fair amount of Google ads and it kind of worked. I mean, like it was the spend was, it was quite expensive, but I mean, the occasional big lead came in and it helped. We, we are doing that, but I would say testing that because we started a couple of months ago. Uh, I'm talking about the Google ads. CEO, we've been doing that since, since the start. Uh, since, well, since we built a new website, which happened last year. Um, CEO is important. Google Ads, we're spending some money on that. Uh, we don't see the return uh, yet, but I think it can work pretty good. Absolutely. CEO, CEO is amazing. It's not that it's free because it takes time to do that, of course. Yeah. So depending where you want to spend the money, but we're doing a lot of CEO. 
and it, it's working. But again, the, the, mo the most leads come from social media, we say. We don't have any sales department at the moment. We don't do sales at all. And we're growing by 30% year on year, so I mean, it's working. Coming back to Elia then, uh, I mean, tell us a bit more about the, the goals of the uh, association for one thing, and also what plans do you have um, as part of your presidency? Oh, okay. So the goals. Uh, I think our main purpose is to, to, to see our members growing. Uh, mm. So we what, what happened to, to my company, for instance. So I started, I was, the first event I was by myself with a part-time project manager, and the marketing person has, had left by that time. And, and we grew a lot since then. And Elia was really uh, essential to this growth. And this is what we want for our members. We are now discussing the strategy for the next three years because you know everything has changed. And members, they might want something different than before. Events might not be the only thing that they, they would like to have right now. So that, that, that's under discussion. Uh, it's not that I want to disclose. It's just that we haven't decided yet where to go. Precisely, and so I th for as far as I am concerned, I, I'm hoping to contribute to for Leah to bring some innovation uh, in the industry for our members because I think that's much needed. Uh, as I said, the, the world is changing, so they might not uh, perceive the same value in what we used to offer a couple of years ago, for instance. Uh, and we can see that. And I would like to engage our. Uh, our members as much as, as we can and to make them understand that, for instance, your growth can also uh, come from visibility and engagement. I don't think it makes sense if you just pay the membership and don't do nothing with it. But mm. it happens quite a, with quite some members that we have at the moment. So I'm trying to change that. And again, I'm mm. hoping to stay, to stay uh, as long as possible in order to be able to change things. Because if you stay there for one year, then, you know, as with politics in Italy, nothing changes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, you had like uh, a few prime ministers. Yeah. <laughs> and none of them <laughs> were, were was <laughs> voted by, by us. So that's a different story. Mm. I mean, it, it sounds generally like you know, the kind of industry associations, the partnerships, the memberships have been quite important to you in terms of raising visibility, uh, your profile, you know, for a, for a number of, I'm sure, networking and a number of different things. Um, I mean, if you think about kind of partnerships with associations, not just Elia, but Gala, ATC, others, I mean, what, you mentioned also that it kind of relies on members a little bit because obviously you can you can get a membership but then not do anything with it. I mean, what what do you think? How do you maximize a membership? Um, and what what do you think? You know, being a member of these organisations uh, and others should typically involve. Well, I think let me start by saying that I think we could do better with that. Mm. Uh, we are with Gala, we are with Elia, we are with ATC, as you said. I'm also with an Italian association. Uh, called Federlingue, uh, so we are quite everywhere. Uh, we could do better, but I, I'm trying myself to first to, to be engaged. So, for instance, I'm in a gala committee for machine translation, post editing, pricing, uh, but not not just pricing, but uh, training. And so I'm I'm active there, I'm taking part in calls and the committee. Uh, with ATC, for instance, we applied our company for a prize and award last year, and by the way, we won. And so we, we try not to be just passive with that. Uh, I think mm -hmm. you really need to be engaged. And if you manage to be engaged in the board, of course, not, it's not for everyone because then we would have a huge board. But that, that's where you really can uh, learn and, and grow, really. And what I'm trying to do, for instance, with Gala and, and even with Alia, I'm trying to, to convince my team members that they have access to a wealth of resources that they can uh, leverage, of course. And this is happening, starting to happen. We do have object objectives, okay, ask for that in the company, specifically. We need to study, and because it's kind of the only one uh, wanted to grow, and of course, they, they welcome the idea and they are reading blogs, they are also publishing blogs as well. That's another important thing. And 
they're also having webinars with the other associations. They are going to their events. So Mid Central Europe is it's not an association, but still it's it's another uh, group of people. So we're trying to be active. Uh, always you can think of. And I'm all for partnering with those associations. I mean, we are friends with Gala, and we want to be friends with anybody else. Uh, and I think that that's the way to go. I, I don't see in the industry, generally speaking, for my company and for the association, I don't see any uh, competitor. Uh, I, I would like to call them partners rather than competitors. Uh, this is why I'm all for sharing and no, if you share, then at the end of the day, you just waste the bar and you compete on something bigger and more challenging and more fun. So that, that's my mindset, more or less, everywhere. Are you planning to do another in-person conference? You already know where? Because I think you were a little bit trailblazing with the one. Where was it? In Rhodes? Or... Yeah, the last one was in Rhodes. It was amazing. Yeah. People they, they were just willing to grab fun and dance and drink and network and meet and swim and whatever. Um, so our next event would be online, unfortunately. It, was, uh, it would be focused for project manager, but that's the, the, the format that we found, I think, is ideal for, for that event. And then I'm working on the next uh, event uh, in Italy together, which will happen in March next year. And this is the event that we were not able to, to have in Milan in 2020 because it was the first one that was cancelled uh, because of COVID. Uh, it was supposed to start on the Wednesday and I had to cancel on the Sunday. It was quite huh. a crisis there. Uh, so yeah, the, the next big one will be in Rome next March. Two Just, years after sorry. it was originally scheduled. <laughs> Rome or Milan? No, it was supposed to be Milan in 2020 and that's the one we cancelled. Oh, now uh, you're going to Rome. Yep. No, don't go to. You could have taken the train to Milano. <laughs> <It's> three hours. <laughs> I know. You know, Milano is. Uh, I love Milano, but Rome, I think, is more attractive for most people in the world. And uh, we opened registration actually this week, and it, it's it's working. I mean, it's really attractive. And, uh, everybody wants to go to to Rome at some point in their life. All right. If you, if you listen to the pod, <laughs> head over to Aaliyah. And uh, get your ticket for Rome. So, <laughs> right, Rome. And if you are in uh, Milan, you take the train to Milan and to Rome, it's, what, three hours. So come on. <laughs> Six hours. Yeah, you, can talk, you can do a little tour, Lorraine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. We, we built the tunnel, <laughs> and so now it's, a lot, it's so much faster. I mean, now they've opened, like, all of the parts of the tunnel. So now it's, I don't know, it's about three hours. Um, now, we always ask that question at the end. Outlook. I don't know, you pick the time frame, two, three, four, five years for the industry and for your uh, company. I start from my company. <laughs> the, well, I want to grow the company and I still want to grow the company and I, I stay here. I also considered by another company in the summer, I was considering uh, like spreading around in Europe. Uh, it didn't happen, and I think I'm staying here for, for long. Uh, I want to go to the company. I want to keep innovating as much as I can uh, with different services and with more integration with the data and so on. Uh, and I think the, the market is, is fertile in terms of innovation. I don't know where the industry is, is heading to. I heard last, last night about uh, Airbnb uh, doing some innovation on the way they're managing localization. I think it's a very interesting market. And uh, let's see what happens. I really I don't have any crystal ball for the market. I think it's, we're going to see many, many things that we don't even, cannot even think of at the moment. If within five years, I think it's going to be very much different from what it is now. So my aim is to be yep. up to date and, you know, listening and trying to not to stay behind. Fantastic. Well, good luck for the next two, three, five years, however long it's going to be. And, uh, you know, hope to see you in Rome if I get trained. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much for doing this, Diego, and uh, all the best. Thank you very much. Thank you, Florian. Thank you. Thanks, Esther. Diego. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.